That video is easy to relate to how on the surface we want it, everything to be perfect. We want to look like everything's perfect, especially when we walk in here on a Sunday morning. But the truth is we each have areas of our heart that are hurting and painful and sometimes just downright broken. And so this series, My Secret Heart, is to address some of those potential areas in each of our hearts where we struggle and there's a darkness that we want to bring to the light of Christ and change it to be how he's asked us to be. We took a look at what it means to doubt and ask those questions and how we bring that before God. Last week, Ben shared with us on hatred and how to bring that before God. Today, we're gonna to talk about the very hard, difficult subject of prejudice. You just mentioned the word racial issue and there's an atmosphere of awkwardness that comes about and there's a tension in the air. And to deal with this, it requires humility on each of our parts and definitely a sense of grace and giving and reflecting who God is to us and we give that to others. A definition of prejudice is dislike, hostility, or unjust behavior deriving from unfounded opinions. Now we can see the extremes of it when people do those horrible unjust behaviors with the very first word, dislike, and that happens with each and one of us. We have an individual that does something to us and we take those feelings and we cast them on a whole group of people. Synonyms for the word prejudice are bigotry, partiality, discrimination, and inequality. Each one of those words are horrible words. But unfortunately, they describe our hearts. This should not be true. None of these words should be true of a follower of Jesus Christ. If we're following him. We don't see these words as part of his life. They should not be a part of ours. So we need to look at ourselves. We need to figure out how we are looking at others and how we are sizing up. A starting point we want to start with is Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So each one of us are an image of God. God created people in his image. We're all created in his image. Each person, the person sitting next to you, as weird as they may be, is created in the image of God. And it's hard for us to understand that because we have, here's the beauty of this individual, but here's the flaws. It's true in your life. That God has created you in his image with all the potential that's there. But unfortunately, sin and stain and bad choices have come in each of our hearts and lives. And sometimes we don't reflect the beauty of God, but it's there. We're all in God's image. Each person is. There's no one in this room or in this world that is here by accident. God has created design in his image. Go back to a very difficult time in our history back in the 60s. Churches were coming together and singing songs about peace and love and outside its walls. There was incredible pain and injustice going on and many of those churches did nothing, history records. And the same thing is true today. There's, there's pain, there's difficulty. Recent history in St. Louis back in August of 2014 and November of that year, November 2017, we saw the riots come up and all of a sudden St. Louis becomes international news as a focus of racial division. And you can say whatever you want about it, but it comes back to there's a lot of pain and a lot of heartache, and especially in this particular area within our city and within the people around us. 
Unfortunately, it's being used politically to, for some people to get ahead and get gains, and that's hard as going to be there. But today we want to look at it not as a political issue, not as a hot button topic on TV that people are blaming each other back and forth. We want to take a look at it as a biblical issue and purely as a heart issue. Because we're never going to solve it through a new law or a new uh, regulation or out here and coming back with our hearts reflecting the beauty of God and seeing God in other people that we can figure it out. I want to say racism is not just about skin color. Racism happens within races and ethnic groups as well. We size people up and put people in categories and just a very obvious example is among whites you have white collar, blue collar, and rednecks. Give me one person, I grew up on a farm, I'd be one of those redneck guys, but you kind of be one you throw everybody in there. Now those can be just accepted as differences, but we also can build up a lot of dislike and harsh emotions and even bad actions come out of those. You go to India, we've been there a few times on missions trips. When I go into the country, I see a lot of beautiful people, they all look the same, but there's incredibly extreme different classes. <laughs> Depend on where you were born and your name means whether you're worthwhile or not. And they size people up of having more value than others, and that's a horrible shame. Because they're all created in God's image. You go to England. If your name happens to have a certain name to the back of it, then you become royalty. And you're more important than everybody else. And everybody, even people in America, fall all over themselves to see someone of royalty. Why is that? Just because I'm born doesn't make me better or worse than anybody else. But we size people up. We see it in the Bible. We're going to give you some examples today in the Bible. Well, let's look at a couple verses. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Paul is speaking, he says, from one man, or he writes here, Luke writes this, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. So God created Adam and Eve, brought them together, he says, from this people, all peoples were made. They all came from God's creation. Verse 27, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Our mission statement as a church is leading people to find and follow Jesus. It comes from different places, but from this verse as well. We want people to find Jesus, to understand who he is. The important thing is recognize that God created all of us. God made people in every nation. God created, designed us. Now the word nation is it's used here in the book of Acts where it says God created men from, I mean every nation of men. That word is actually the word ethnos. The word is ethnos, from that we get the word ethnic. And it means a word about groups of people or multitudes or ethnicities. So it says God made people of every nation. He made every ethnic group out there. They all came from his first creation. We're all designed in the image of God. And we come together and we reflect his beauty and his glory and who he is, regardless of our sin, our, of our races, our, our skin color, our groupings where we come from. We're all attracted to what we call the homogeneous groups. The word homogeneous means of the same kind or alike. We're attracted to people who are alike us. Because there's similarity. We're, we're attracted to people that are easy and comfortable to get with. We can relate to people of the same age group. People in even the same income group we can connect with. People with the same kind of education. People in the same stage of life. People in the same family status as ours. And people in the same race. There's an easy way we can connect to each other. There's nothing wrong with that. A, a good, good example we referred to in the past was in St. Louis. You meet someone from St. Louis, they ask a question. They always say, what? <laughs> you know that. What high school are you from? That's a way of sizing up, that's a way of connecting, and all, and all of a sudden, when you do that, you know, whether they say this place, or they say this place, you go, oh, you're, you're from that area, we size people up, we connect. It's wrong, but it's how it is. It's how we're drawn to each other, and we see in the Bible, in Acts chapter 10, Peter was part of a group. He was the Jewish group, he'd follow, been a follower of Jesus for three years. Now he's this great preacher leading the movement. He's out there and God says, I want you to go up to Caesarea by the sea and I want you to speak to a Gentile. And his first response is, uh-uh. And he has to give him his strong vision. He goes, he gets there reluctantly, but he has difficulty because Cornelius is a Gentile. It's a different race. 
It's a different religion. He doesn't want to cross that boundary. He prides himself that he never has crossed that boundary. But God pushes and shoves him into it. He finally does. And after he's there, he presents the gospel. Cornelius and all of his family, his household, all become believers. And we see this now in Acts chapter 10, verse 34. It says that Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation, that again, ethnos, who fear him and do what is right. And it took a while for Peter to understand that, that God loves everybody. And we have difficulties with people of a different look, a different school or a different homogeneous group than ours. We have difficulty with people from a different religion. But I can understand that God created all of us. And think about some part of your heart that when you run into this person or you think of this person, what is your influence? What is your reaction? Is it as Jesus would or is it something else that stirs in your heart? Understand that God gives value to people of every nation. God gives value to them. He understands them. They're created in his image. And we see Peter who gets that. He goes, oh, I've got to understand. But we see later in the same book as we read along, Peter forgot about that. He slips up. And we can sit in this room and say, that's right. Jesus created all of us. He loves every one of us. We we're going to do this. But sometime during this week, we're going to have the tendency to slip back because it's in our hearts. And we see him slipping back. And he goes up to this place. He's, he's in Antioch. And he's eating with the Gentiles. And he's doing really well. And all of a sudden, some of his Jewish friends show up. And when they show up, he kind of takes a look around. And he steps back. And he changes. He actually moves a different direction. Because when his friends show up, he doesn't want to be seen associating with the Gentiles. And so he moves over. And we look at that and we go, no, it's wrong. You may be fine one-on-one, -on -one, but when your friends show up, how do you react? Are you crossing those lines as Jesus would? And Peter, or Paul comes along and sees him, and Paul calls him out on him. Paul says, what are you doing? In Galatians, he really hits him hard and says, this is wrong what you are doing. We're standing for what God has called us to and not do this going back and forth. And some of us say, well, I'm doing pretty well with this. But you know a good way to find out is you ask someone in a different group how you're doing with it. Because it's hard. We have our blind spots. Peter didn't see it in himself, but Paul sure saw it in him. We have those frank conversations with other people. And you ask someone in a different group, a different ethnic group, or a different area around you at work and say, hey, how do you think I'm doing in this area of prejudice? Racism. How do I come across? And you'd be surprised at the little things that we say. We don't even realize how offensive they can be to others. But ask questions. I've done that. I've got different people in this church who I've asked, said, would you please speak into my life if I say things or if I come across in a way that's offensive? Please let me know because from my eyes, I don't see it. And we need people to help us understand. We see in Acts chapter 6. There was a problem with the church coming together, the early church, they were there, they were taking care of their widows and providing for them in a good way because there wasn't a, a government system to provide for them. But a problem arose because the Jewish widows were being treated much better than the Greek widows. Now this wasn't a problem between black and white and brown, this is a problem between ethnic groups, but it's different, they're different races. There's Jewish people and then there's others. And the Jewish people were being favored in front of the others. So they didn't even realize it, but the Greeks stood up and said, this is not right. What are you doing here? It sounds like our world today, doesn't it? Where well, the predominant group is being shown favoritism, and we don't understand what it is, but there is a truth in that. That when you're the majority, there is a majority going that direction, and so there is a truth to it. You just mentioned white privilege, and it just makes you angry, some of you. It just riles in you because we see it politically used in a bad way. You're going to get mad about it, but it is a truth that's there. It's just truth. When you're in the majority, there's some things over there. Now, we're really pushing hard for a minority status and putting it ahead, and that's put it, put it in front of us. But if you're in the majority, you don't even realize, realize the advantages you have. You have some very frank, honest questions with people in the minority and say, would you speak into me to help me to understand this? Appreciate Jeffrey Woodson down here as one of those people who speaks to my life. And he gave me a book a while back. It's called I Am Still Here by Austin Cheney Brown. And this little book, you can sit down and read it in one setting, just really mess with me. It was written by a minority. And she's writing and saying, these are the difficulties that I face in life. And I'm reading this little book and I actually feel really guilty. I feel really bad. And then the next chapter I read, I just thought, wow, 
what am I supposed to do with this guy? The next chapter was on white privilege and white guilt. And what comes with that is this thing called guilt. I feel guilty for being what I am. And that is absolutely not what God's plans for us to be. That doesn't get us anywhere. I need to look at it, understand it, but don't just feel guilty for how God created you. You appreciate what God's created in you. But you learn how to take what you've got and use it to reach out to build peace and speak truth in other people. We see in James chapter 2, another teaching where it says that God does not show favoritism. And this time, the division was over money, given priority to people who have more money than others who do not. And we want to impress people, and so we were doing things within the church, and James says, do not do this because God does not show favoritism to one group over another. We find ourselves slipping into that so easily because there's people we want to be like and we wish we were. And he uses the phrases in there about don't show favoritism, do not discriminate, but you love your neighbor and those around you. Dr. Mark Creer says this, Racial barriers drive their power, but people refuse to talk and instead make assumptions based on stereotypes, media-driven narratives, upbringing, and certain assumptions based on their own perception. I really appreciate that quote. Because we make assumptions based upon what we've seen, what we've experienced in this particular setting, especially the media one. You know, what I watch the news, it just makes me angry, upset, agitates me, and I can think, well, everybody's doing this. Well, no, that's just what that particular group may be saying. But what is God calling you? What is influencing your heart, especially in this area? Racial prejudice, without a doubt, is a sin. It's just a sin. How about an amen on that? And it's there. And some of us just say, well, that's just how I am, and you're proud of it, and shame on you when you say that. Because it is a sin. It's not what God's called for. He's called us to be peacemakers, to be proactively going out and seeking healing, especially racially. The healing of hearts in relationship to God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's pretty clear. God's king has given us grace. We're all children of God. We're all to be reconciled to him. The church should be a place where men and women come together before God. People of every race come before God. People of every different financial background and status and social economic group. That we can all come together and we are one family. Children of God. We're all worshiping one God together. With no division. That's another amen point. Can we just get that picture? Wouldn't it be great if that was true? And unfortunately, Martin Luther King said way back in the 60s and still today that Sunday morning hour is the most racially segregated time in our country. And it should not be. But it won't change on Sunday morning until it changes all week long in the hearts of the followers of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. We have this verse. Let me find it over here. It says, For, his, for he himself is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh its law with its commandments and regulations. Now it talks about these two becoming one. We think of that as happening in marriage, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about a division that took place between the Jews and the Gentiles. And again, it's a racial division. And Jesus came in when he reconciled us to God and says he broke down this barrier that's dividing. I like the strong word in there, this, the commandments and regulations, it's from the Old Testament, it's going to be there, but the people are taking that, they were using it in a very harsh way. And in the name of God, they were dividing people up. And it says, he came and he destroyed this barrier. He destroyed the wall of hostility. In our world around us, there's a lot of hostility. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of pain. And how is that solved? It's solved by the grace of Jesus Christ. Not by a new rule or a law. Next verse continues on. It says his purpose, Jesus' purpose, was to create in himself one new man out of the two. So there's not the division between ethnic groups or racism. Thus making peace and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. These words, there's peace. There's reconciliation. First we're reconciled to God and then we are reconciled to each other. 
When we do that, then the hostility leaves. Next verse, verse 17. It says, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So Jesus comes to give peace. It's through his grace that's there. And as a follower of Jesus, we are to be doing the same thing. Your words should be words of peace. Your words should be words of reconciliation. Your words should be saying, come together. We're all a family together in God. But people will not see the peace of Jesus until they see it in your heart and in your life. And it has to flow out of your heart. See, Jesus came to give us peace with God. Clearly. And it's going to start there. We can't go out here and fix all the world's problems if you don't have your heart right with God to begin with. Understand that he's come to reconcile us so we can have peace with him. The hostility between you and God within your heart needs to be changed first. And then realize that Jesus came and gives peace with one another. So it starts between me and God, and then it begins with others. And this should describe our church. It describes you as a follower of Jesus. We look inward. We look at our heart. And we need to repent and say, God, forgive me of this bitterness, this hurt, this pain that I have. That I'm casting off on others and realize it's only through his grace that we overcome the hatred in his life. Last week, Ben shared on hatred. I would say this message is a part two of the same one. Because if you've got prejudice in your heart, or I should say, when you have prejudice in your heart, it is an outflow of hatred and hurt and pain and bitterness. It's not an outflow of the grace of Jesus Christ. Hostility is overcome with the love of God, and we must choose his love. Would you watch a short little video clip of an incredible man? that are there. 
Appreciate the fact that we come from different economic backgrounds, different social backgrounds, different worlds. We look different in our skin. We look different in our heights, all those things. Appreciate all that. We come together. Then we reflect the beauty of God, and we embrace people. And it begins by understanding others and listening to their stories and saying, tell me about your life. And tell me what's going on with you. And so to help us again a little bit, I've asked a, a, a couple in our church to come join me. So Lamar and Brandy, if you come up. Enjoy me a little bit. We're going to just, I want you to hear their stories. So this is Lamar and Brandy. Come on. Welcome. I'm glad you're up here. Thank you. So they're, they're nice people. You've seen them around. They've been here for a long time. And you got sweet little Brindley in the children's ministry over there. So um, these, these guys are fun. Please. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad she's up. Hopefully she's still there. Yep. Hopefully. She's yep. not hurting anybody. No, 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 no. <laughs> She's a sweetheart. So I, I love these two, and I, you guys have great stories. So you come from uh, different settings. So Brandy, first of all, tell the people where you're from, what your home's like. I am from an extremely small town in Kansas. Um, small, I mean, we had 12 people in my eighth grade class. That's pretty small. <laughs> yeah. So it was predominantly white. I would say 99%. It was extremely, you know, rural. We lived on 160 acres uh, farming. And then uh, I was there for 14 years. And then we moved to a little bit bigger city, closer to Wichita on the outside. Uh, and, uh, still Kansas. Yep, still in Kansas. And um, that's where my family still lives. My mom lives there. My dad still lives where I grew up. And then you came to school here and lived in I came, yeah, I had a basketball scholarship. That's cool. I played basketball here. And then I just, I couldn't go back to the small town. <laughs> no, no, no. I understand. Yes. Yeah, okay. That's good. So you're St. Louis person now. So, Lamar, you're going to come from Kansas. Tell me about, <laughs> tell me about your life. <laughs>
you're not going to, uh, she goes, she, uh, I guess I'm from anyone else. So she said, uh, she said, you're not smart because you're funny. And you're hurt. And then he came home to me and he said, Dad, I want you to just punch you in the face and say, you can't do that, kid. I said, you have to go back and say, Jesus loved all of us. And Caleb went back to school the next day and told a little girl that Jesus loved all of them and he never had a problem to sin. We don't teach color in our family. We teach green. I'm a military guy. I've got to tell you that part. And on the battlefield, you won't see, you know, you're, you're going to protect each other. No matter what, we're all green. You know, we don't see color. So um, that's the world we teach our family. Love and see green. That's it. So your bully different worlds come together and your family loves accepting each other. Yeah, yeah his, his family's great. It's, he's a little bit older than me, so he has nieces that are my age and they're like, auntie, auntie, and I'm like, wait, wait, no, no. <laughs> but um, yeah, his family's great, you know, they call me sister and it's, you know, we always say we love you, we love each other, and... Kind of the difference, you have one brother, right? you have siblings? Yes, I do have siblings. Yeah, how many do you have? Well, I've had half since that, okay. since it's like five or six, I okay. can't keep track. And you're, you're, you're about 12. I'm more than 12. So how about, how about your family, how to accept you? Oh, man. First of all, her dad always says, uh, don't take this wrong, her dad always says, I'm the biggest shit ever. You know, he always say that, because he's from a rural area country, I'm telling you, when I went to Kingman, Kansas, I was like, whoa. So when I <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you right now, they love me. They don't see color. I'm telling you, her family don't see color. They love me for me. And um, I love them, and my family love Miami. And, and I'm telling you, we are the city of the cities. They are the country of the countries. <laughs> hey, you should start a wedding reception. I'm never. <laughs> The line there is one in the wild at the same time. I like to see that. Well, I thought I wanted you to hear of two people who love Jesus and see what God can do, not just their hearts, but their family around them, and see this is what God's calls to be. People who love and reach out and bring peace to others. So you guys do that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. chapter 12, verse 16. Would you read this with me? Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. So we're supposed to love, love others. We're supposed to live with them, bring peace to others. But it's got to start with your heart. We've got to start talking about it. You need to go up to someone and say, hey, would you speak into my life? Would you help me understand? And Instead of just casting off everybody what you see from the news, would you just learn to meet somebody, or meet somebody, ask a question, teach your kids. There's a book we have down at the, the cafe bookstore, it's called The Gospel in Color, and I recommend this to you if you're a parent, especially if an elementary or age child, go get this book and teach them. Talk about it, bring it up, help them understand this is what God does, this is how God created us, that God designed us. And have conversations within your family, not just off of what you hear in the news, but what God has to say. Appreciate this quote by Glenn Elliott, it says, we are to move from tolerance and acceptance to engagement and appreciation. Just move to that place. We just don't get along, but we encourage peacemakers. Each person is creating the image of God, and we live at peace with Him and with the others. Then we reflect the beauty of God, not when we're divided up. Father, we're grateful that you love us, that you give us peace. Father, that you desire for, that we would know you and understand you in your grace. And Father, I pray that you help us to let that grace sink into every part of our heart. And Father, parts of our heart where there's bitterness and pain and anger and hatred. Father, I pray that we have the courage 
here just to bring that to light, to admit it before you. And Father, we want the prejudice to be gone. We want the, the short-sightedness of our heart and attitudes to be gone. And Father, help us to become intentional peacemakers like Jesus. Help us to become true followers who would go out of our way to reach out to people who are different to demonstrate your love and your grace. Father, I pray that you help us that we receive your love and your grace today and commit to share that with others. So Jesus, we pray.